Now, today here on Focus, we're bringing you uh, a very disturbing and also a very personal story. It is the story of a teenage girl from Burma. I shall explain to you how her parents were shot in front of her eyes and how she was then raped by Burmese junta soldiers. Our allegation is that the uh, Burmese authorities are clearly giving the go-ahead to its troops to use rape as a military weapon in its operations against any rebellions. Well, in a moment, we'll uh, discuss her story and the wider issues with someone from Human Rights Watch, but first... Here's the young girl's story. We are in the extreme north of Thailand, a stone's throw from Burma. We meet in a secret place for the safety of our adolescent interviewee, who is seeking refuge with an activist network. She's only 16 and comes from Shan State in Burma. Newly arrived, she's trying to put a terrible ordeal behind her. The soldiers arrived in the village. One of them dragged me. I begged him to spare me, but he screamed louder. I couldn't understand his words. My father and mother tried to help me. He shot and killed them both. We know that Burmese soldiers rape women, but I never thought it would happen to me. I will live this nightmare every day. It's as clear as a photograph. Sixteen years old, raped, orphaned. It's an unbearable testimony. We also traumatized and we also sad, you know, about the situation. But, you know, yeah, we cry, you know, and we are sad, but it's not enough just to be sad and angry, you know, but we also have to work for change. These never-before-seen images were filmed in July, not far from the adolescent's village. Aided by thousands of soldiers and air power, the Burmese army launched a violent offensive against the rebels. Women are often the first victims in these campaigns. It is very clear that the Burma military regime is using rape as a weapon of war against uh, women in the ethnic area so that uh, they can control and uh, terrorize and demoralize the local community. Is there a license to kill and rape during Burma's military offensives? Yes, according to the testimony of dozens of deserters from Burma who are taking refuge with the insurgents. These orders are given from the highest ranks of the military command. We have proved that battalion chiefs give free reign to their soldiers. They make speeches in which they say, you are in the front lines and it's dangerous, so basically do whatever you want. So in the field, Burmese soldiers can rape and kill with total impunity. Officially, there is no offensive and no rape in the new Burma. Since the 2010 elections, vague promises have given the dictatorship a more presentable image. Just back from Burma, the EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Affairs is very optimistic. We brought her the message of this adolescent victim. We met uh, one special case of a 16-year-old lady, mm -hmm. which has been raped by Burmese soldiers. Her mother and father have been killed on spot in front of her, and she was very shocked and skeptical about this EU engagement. What is your answer to her? My, my take is that uh, it would take time between decisions at the top and action uh, locally. I am not convinced that the people I met are launching today ethnic cleansing. Their commitment is to peace in the country. They want to see peace in the country. Patience, then, a tough road ahead for a 16-year-old raped and orphaned, awaiting peace in her native Burma. Yeah, an incredible story there. And joining me now uh, from Bangkok is Phil Robertson. He's Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch in Asia. Thanks very much for talking to us today. Um, we heard that one individual story. Do, do you think it's a one-off? Well, uh, as you know, these are remote, difficult-to-reach areas uh, in effective war zones. So we have not been able to independently verify these reports. Uh, I can't really say how many cases have occurred or how widespread these abuses are. But uh, what we can say is that we're deeply concerned about the long-standing reports of sexual violence uh, that have been perpetrated uh, with impunity by the Burma Army in these ethnic areas, um, and the fact that there's been very little action by the international community uh, to hold accountable uh, the Burmese Army for those abuses. And you mentioned widespread reports there. What um, reports have you had? Well, you know, going back to 2002, the Shan Women's Action Network uh, famously documented a sign significant number of cases. Uh, there has been efforts to document uh, additional cases since then. Uh, the core of the report, however, is that uh, there is some sort of order coming from on high to uh, use 
uh, rape as a weapon of war, and we have not been, in, been able to independently confirm that. I mean, obviously, as you say, a lot, a lot of individual stories do come out, uh, and uh, admittedly, it, it must be incredibly difficult to um, find out exactly what's going on within the country. But presumably, the individual stories add up to a picture which can give you some kind of impression. Well, the impression is very clear that uh, the Burmese army acts with impunity when it goes into these ethnic areas. Uh, it has a long history of use of convict porters, use of local people as porters, uh, laying of landmines, uh, indiscriminate uh, shooting and killing of civilians, uh, burning of uh, households and villages. Uh, the litany of abuses that the Burmese army perpetrates when it goes into these areas is long and extensive and well documented. Uh, and as part of that, uh, there have been cases uh, of rape uh, certainly committed. Uh, the question is, of course, uh, finding if there is a uh, larger order of pattern uh, to, to that uh, beyond the fact that they don't discipline their soldiers who sexually abuse women. What image do you have of um, Burma's ruling regime? I mean, some might say, trying to improve its international image, elections they had in 2010, Bill Bing as a stepping stone, if you like, on the road to, to uh, democracy. Do you think they are really trying to, to do that or actually just doing what they want to behind closed doors? Well, first of all, the elections in 2010 were really a travesty. There was a, it was a stolen election. There was a lot of ballot stuffing and manipulation of advanced voting. Uh, recently, the Burmese government has been doing more to try to improve it, the atmosphere by talking up reform, but we haven't seen much beyond meetings and talk. Um, uh, the real test that we see is whether the Burmese government will uh, go forward and uh, release the over 2,000 political prisoners uh, who are still uh, being detained in Burma today. That was the call yesterday of the UN Secretary General. And also, we think that uh, another key test is whether the Burmese government is prepared to hold accountable uh, the army officials who shot down civilians and Buddhist monks four years ago during the Saffron Revolution in Rangoon and other cities. Uh, so there's a lot of tests in front of the Burmese government. What we're seeing is a lot of talk. We're seeing a lot of international visitors. We even see the announcement of a Burma National Human Rights Commission, uh, although it seems to be appointed primarily full of... Uh, former civil servants, so it's not clear how independent we'll be. There's a um, lot of talk. Phil, so really, so really briefly, no we're, we're running out of time. Just wanted to ask you very, very quickly. Is, is there any pressure that outside governments or Human Rights Watch can put on the authorities there? Well, we're calling for an international commission of inquiry into crimes against humanity in Burma. There has been a long-standing uh, pattern of abuse, uh, particularly in these ethnic uh, min uh, minority areas uh, along the borders. We think that uh, there should be that kind of investigation that would look into abuses uh, by all sides to the conflict. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're seeing more of a focus on, uh, you know, the EU saying reform takes time and change will come slowly to conflict areas. You know, abuses are taking place right now, so they need to, they need to take action. They can't just call for more time and, and, and go on the impressions of, uh, of meetings in Napidaw. Phil, I'll have to interrupt you. Phil Robinson, uh, Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch in Asia. Thanks very much. Uh, that was today's focus here on France 1